Eclipse a Guide. The book's designer, Gene Eaton, couldn't be with us tonight and gives his apologies. Please make very welcome Phil Doherty, Tom Montgomery. Um, Tom, I see both of you are not wearing your specially made gum nut baby costumes tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, um, which we used to be supposed to be, Snipple Fog or Paddle Fog? Thanks, Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Sean. Did give us a break. <laughs> we'll talk about the book. Um, so, the idea of producing some some form of Euclid ID um, sort of was, was hatched by you um, some time ago, Phil. It was going to be a pamphlet. It was going to be a pamphlet. I'm not sure if anyone... Oh, people probably do know. I, I got a Euclid Fellowship in 2021. And part of them was growing all the Kimberley Eucalypts from collecting the seed, growing the plants, and then planting them out at the Peru North Botanic Park on Muggabulla Road. And when I applied for it, I'd said that I'd also do a little brochure to go along with the, the, um, the planting just to give people information. But we discovered there was a few too many to put on the brochure, <laughs> even, even if we drew them very small. So we decided to can that idea. And, and luckily I had a, a little bit of money left over from the fellowship and our skippers uh, put in a bit of money so we were able to produce the book. So that's where it was. So specimens for the book, when did collecting sort of really start in earnest? Sort of like? Well, I started collecting before I got the fellowship actually because I was, I was going to do it anyhow. Yes. Um, I decided that I'd do it anyhow. So I, I, in, my, in, my, in my last job I travelled a lot around the Kimberley so it gave me something to do to make me not think about work after work, you know what I mean? So. Um, it, it took my mind away from worrying about work, so I'd, I'd get in the car and drive around wherever I was and go and click things. And uh, the book, you know, came to fruition. I, I met Tom out at Lake Eater, and I knew I knew who he was, but it was only then that I met him officially. And uh, I cheekily said to him, "Oh, Tom, would you like to do a few drawings for me?" <laughs> And I think he regretted it ever since. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was your first knowledge, Tom, of, uh, of the project. Um, but but tell us about that that field trip and that conversation with Phil, and and what he was suggesting that you might yeah about you know his idea of the book. Um, well, that's the first time I met him. But, um, he did mention it, and I was kind of looking towards something scientific, that type of illustration. And just with what I paint already, I just thought that would kind of fit with my future goals of what I might be, you know, doing as well. So in my art, so it just all lined up. And, yeah. and he and he worked for um, minimum minimum rate, <laughs> so yeah, he, he got a pittance to do it. And and, a for it. and yeah, and this is what Tom would get. He'd get a paper bag with the uh, specimens in it. I gave him a box of those and that's what he had to work on. So he'd get, a, he'd get some fruit, like such, and then he'd get a leaf and he'd have to keep them in order. So um, we were missing a few bits and pieces, weren't we, yeah. Tom? So, yeah, we, it was over a period of time. Yeah. Yeah. As, as you were saying, that, that uh, you received so many specimens time and rather than sort of everything at once and you just sort of worked away um, piece by piece. Yeah, um, during the wet season you had a bit more time to do things like that so I just had uh, like a, a box of specimens and just one like bring one out at a time and instead of watching TV I just sketch away and, and do a few and then transfer it to the next box and just yeah do that over the whole wet. We got there. So around about how long, Tom? Like one specimen, you know, like that's that's leaf and fruit and. Well, to start off with, and depending on the complexity of it, um, it's probably probably took half an hour to 
so or more. But um, after about used to it, I could do it even quicker than that. But unless it was something really complicated, then it would be. Because the variety within yeah. 66 of them, mm. um, some, as you say, way more complex than others. Yeah, yeah. Some, yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. yeah once you get the eye in, Mm. And the donations, I think, of the, mm. the leaf is one of the trickier things mm. to keep the hand stable to, to do all that, that fine work. Because if you just go for a little bit, it's just real long and yeah. Start again. Yeah. <laughs> and your interest, Tom, in, in the botanical side, mm. specimens and, and, and your art, that has sort of really been or come through uh, your time on your parents' block yeah. down yeah. Mowbray Way. Yeah. Next to yeah. National Park, and so there were people down there, artists that were doing something similar. Yeah, and that's in, been an influence. Down south, there's a lot of botanical artists, and I just had books when I was a kid on a few of them. Um, uh, Philip and Nicolinsky and Pat Nevis, they were the books on the botanicals of the southwest. And I just used to study them, and all of these plants were all around me, so I was always had a connection to those things, and I always wanted to paint and I put those things together. I think that's probably why I wanted to take it on this job as well. That's where I kind of started. Mm -hmm. Love job. Mm -hmm. yeah. When Phil <laughs> suggested the idea of the book to you, Tom, I mean, quite the moment for you, I guess, in that, you know, Tom down south and coming up here and he's been here for so many years and then the idea of the book and it, it must have been sort of, you know, jumping. Um, yeah. Or, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. good and I like the, the way that was able to illustrate it because um, in my river a lot of the, the plants are quite small and intricate and that kind of with these tropical plants a lot of them are quite broad and, and all the greens are very similar so it's hard to do the botanicals that I would do in my river so doing the line work just getting back to that detail what I quite like to do. So. I think you'll all agree that the attention to detail is spectacular in, uh, in all of these illustrations in, in the book. And um, if on your way in you didn't uh, take in the display that the library staff have put together here just at the entrance, do uh, take the time before you leave or at some point to take it. It's just fantastic. And either side of the centre of the display, um, Tom, was just recently um, those, uh, all 66 are represented in, that, in those, those drops. That's on paper, on fabric? Or? Uh, it's on a canvas. On a like canvas. A scroll, hanging scroll. You'll see it there. If you haven't looked already, you must um, have a look at that on your, on your way out. Um, would, be, would be great. Um, Phil, uh, National Euclid Day on the 23rd, uh, and it was Euclid Australia. Um, that yeah, you, so I got the fellowship for Euclid Australia. They give you a three a year, up to $25,000. Um, and they also give out um, some small grants for people who hold Euclid Australia Day, National Euclid Day, which is on the 23rd of sorry, 23rd of um, March each year. And I think the last couple of years we well, I don't think I know we did a couple of coach tours around around um, Broome to celebrate National Euclid Day. EK put out a pamphlet about four or five years ago to celebrate EK about Carimbia paractia, the, uh, the cable beach ghost gun that only grows on the Broome Peninsula and nowhere else. Uh, there's, there's a couple of brochures at the, on the display desk out the front if people want to grab one on the way out. Oh, there's not many there, so. The, the furthest trip to collect for the book, the furthest that you would have gone from town uh, probably Kununurra, but the most exciting one, one was um, I had a bit of money left at the end and there was two, two eucalypts I hadn't collected and my old mate George Swan knew where they were and he said if, he, if I took him, he'd show me where they were. <laughs> he, he, knew, he knew I wanted to go in a helicopter, so it was the only way to get there actually, in a helicopter. He, he, he said he would take me there if I took him with him, so I took him with him. So, took him with me, took him with me. So I suppose one of those is an undescribed euclid and, it, and it's in the book Carimbia Yampi. It hasn't, hasn't been described officially yet. And that's why it's in, uh, in capital letters. So we had to fly onto the Yampi, what is it called, the military ground? 
Yeah, we had to get I had to get permission to fly in and and land there in the helicopter. Anyhow, Groves on the top of a Mesa, so the guy who was flying the helicopter, he hadn't done much flying in the Kimberley. He, he was an experienced helicopter pilot, but just hadn't done much flying in the Kimberley. And we had to fly around for about 15 minutes while we found a little flat spot on the top of this this Mesa. So that, that was a bit, bit of fun there for a while. Um, and then we flew across uh, across the horizontal, so it was a bit of a sightseeing tour as well, we flew across the horizontal, <laughs> horizontal waterfall and, and then across the Yankee up, up to um, near Mount Elizabeth and there was another Euclid there called uh, Carimbia papillosa and it's, it's only, it only grows in a spot of uh, one in, in WA in one spot just near Mount Elizabeth and we had a few bold starts, we, we thought we were going to do a bit more sightseeing because George was, certainly knew where it was and we we landed and you know it was March. It was like this, and we we spent an hour and a half wandering around. We couldn't find it. George said, oh, "I don't think this is a spot." So we flew to another spot, and, and luckily it was there. But in the meantime, they had chewed up all our time to go sightseeing elsewhere. So and um, and as we took off, no one else noticed. He flew because they were in a, in amongst a big heap of trees. He he, uh, he clipped a branch, and I actually yeah. Got a bit but we, we don't know. <laughs> Phil, on page four of Kimberley Eclipse, a guide, you write 20 of the 66 species are endemic to the region. Six of these are classified as priority species for protection because of their specialised locations, which can make them vulnerable to extreme fire, grazing, and land clearing. Um, are you aware of any work currently being done to assess the vulnerability of any particular species of Kimberley Um I don't think there is any of them. Oh, a, a few years ago, the, um, Tim Willing and, uh, and some staff from BBCA did us uh, a um, pretty thorough survey of Eucalyptus moriana, and I think that, and, and part of what came about from that was that moriana grows with. Uh, Eucalyptus revelata, and they thought there was two forms of Moriana, but they, from from the, the uh, work they did, they decided that they were both different. They were different plants, and um, they split them, and that's where Eucalyptus revelata came from. So it was only named in 2019, and they both only grow right up the top of the the warm and really windy ranges. So. That, that's the last bit of work. And then Environs Kimberley have done a lot of work around the mapping of Carimbia paraxia in, in, um, in partnership with DBCA and, and um, the Yarra and the PBC. So apart from that, no, Shane. Um, is there a particular species of Kimberley eclipse you consider needs a high level of protection for? Um, oh, I think... I think um, Carimbia peractia does because it only grows on the peninsula. So out to Brip, you know, all know where the turn off to um, Lombardina is. So it grows round here. There's a beautiful specimen out the back here. That's so the Cable Beach. Cable yeah. Beach ghost yeah. gum. So it grows out to Brip, where they're actually um, expanding. You know the Broome uh, Industrial Park out on the road there, which is which there's quite a lot of Carimbia peractia in, in that actual park that they're about to clear. So I, I think there needs to be a bit more thought about, about you know, how we clear around room, especially in relation to room being practice, because like I said, what is, from here to there, it's 10 k's, and how wide is a peninsula 10 k's? So, you know, what have we got? 100, yep. 100 square kilometres, that's, that's our new place for room being practice. Yeah. yeah. The illustrations within uh, can be eclipsed, a guide are spectacular. Tom, and I'm sure everyone here will agree. Um, maybe just tell us a little bit, Tom, about your your methods and like how you, when you did sketch, or sketch, when you have done those illustrations within the book, um, methods you've used. Um, it's pretty pretty basic. It's just um, just an art liner, and then I just have um, something to stop any any smudging and like a, a sheet of paper, and then I just. Um, Actually, I get a mechanical pen first and do the, the outline and sketch it all out, and then I get the um, art liner and work on that. And 
um, just visually looking at those specimens to get all the details. And then, because um, it's supposed to be the same size, so especially some of the smaller ones, it's quite tricky to get those tiny little details. But I think it's important to be able to look at the specimen side by side. The scale. To the scale. Yeah. So, so Tom drew them all the scale. So in, in the book, the fruit are all the scale, so that's the actual size. And, and we wanted that because, you know, when people <coughs> come and ask you, oh, what's this? They normally bring in either a, a fruit or, or a leaf. So we thought, ha uh, we thought having the, the fruit to scale would, would help people if they pick up a bit of fruit and they can go through the book and go, oh, it looks like that, but it's probably not because it's too big or too small. Oh, so Just on, in relation to the book, uh, this is the most important page, the acknowledgements that there was a lot of people contributed to the book and, and, and to the fellowship. So I just want to draw everyone's attention. Can you make sure if you buy the book, you read that first? You don't put it in. No, no, this is the, uh, whatever copy it's called. And I, and I don't want to, I don't want to pick out too many individuals, um, Tom, Jean, but Pat Lowe also spent, I, I went back and luckily, luckily we lived close to each other, but I was over at Pat's a fair bit. We drank lots of cups of tea, but um, Pat spent hours and hours and hours editing, editing it. And if, if you speak to Gene about it, he'll say it, it was quite a difficult book because it, there was a lot of technical detail in it uh, that, that needed checking all the time. And, and Pat, she's like a Fox Terrier when it comes to the letter in the wrong place. So, yes. We got there eventually. And if you can, if you find any mistakes, let her know, please. <laughs> I'm going to do it, everyone. Pat Lowe. <laughs> How are we going? What do you reckon, Phil? Yeah, that's enough for it. <laughs> Tom? Yeah, <laughs> Uh, I guess uh, that's officially launched. It, it certainly is the author and illustrator's hope that you all get out there and into the Kimberley, the Broom Peninsula, your own street, your own backyard to discover these magnificent eucalypts, 10 of which can be found within 50k. Uh, look closer at the leaves, touch them, smell them, look for flowers, look for fruit, learn, lay down under a favourite eucalypt, fall asleep, wake up, roll around a bit, and all the while have close a copy of Kimberly Eucalypt. Goodbye. Ladies and gentlemen, come on, Gomery, Kimberly,